days, all days. Been a road, been a road. Man, I know I used the term that I got a special guest. You might have heard me say it a couple of times. But the day, as the youngest would say, I got a special guest in all caps, man. My <laughs> man, the counselor of Washington, D.C., Trey R. White. Kirk, man, what's up, big guy? How you man, feel? Man, I'm blessed, man. I'm yeah. blessed, man. You know, this time moving good, man. Good stuff lined up, man. I'm just happy to have you here, man. Yeah. Let's just dive straight into it, man. Trey R. White, the counselor, a.k.a. Trey. Yeah. Any other nicknames you got? Or was this Trey? Uh, well, I had some got? along the way, man. Suave. So, Brown, <laughs> Trey Day, uh, you know, you know how it is growing up in the yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, you yeah. get nicknames every every two years. Was it Swall for the style? What that was about? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had Stinky Style Me, so I had a few. I had a few. Well, for people that's outside of Washington, D.C., I know you're from Washington, uh, Southeast Washington, D.C. What part of uh, Southeast you from in Washington, D.C.? I'm from First Street. That's the uh, Highland, MLK uh, Avenue area, Congress Heights community. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Give, give us a visual. Give me a, a picture of a visual back in the day of an inside Trey, Trey House and then coming outside in Highland, Southeast D.C. All right. So uh, first, man, you know, I grew up in a, in a close-knit family. Mm -hmm. uh, on my great-grandmother's side, she had 13 kids. And on my grandfather's side... <laughs> His father had 22 kids. They was more so from the, like the Linda Poland area, but all of us, mostly all of us was in Southeast. We had some that was in the Trinidad area, but you know, my, uh, my mother raised uh, four of us with my grandmother's help. Uh, we lived in a two bedroom. There's normally eight people living in a two bedroom growing up with cousins coming in and out. Cause right. my cousins, you know, when they was in the streets, they lived with us, didn't live with us. And there was always some transition going on. But it, it was, man, it was some good times and bad times. You know, I grew up in the eighties and nineties when DC was DC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was tough, man. But it, it, as a child, we just had a lot of fun. Played the number eleven boys and girls club. Right. Uh, was an athlete, you know. Um, grew up just like a regular kid in Southeast, man. Trying to survive the streets, man. Right. What was your favorite sport? Uh, well, it was originally football, but I didn't get much bigger. Right. Yeah, so yeah, I stopped yeah, playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ironically, I played basketball in high school from from ninth grade to twelfth grade. Right. Uh, I end up I played football a lot little league coming up. Right. Uh, and then I, I end up coaching. Little League football um, in my senior year of high school. Uh, yeah. I coached from, for nine years, Little right. League football. Yeah, yeah I, I know about that. I'm going to get to that, too. That's strong. Yeah. Man, so the part of South D.C. from, for those who don't know, I know that was on, off that first year. It was a lot of, uh, at that time, was it heroin or was it crack? What was the biggest strips air over uh, drug markers over there? Oh, man, it was a little bit of everything. everything. It depending on which corner you go. Right. You know, yeah. you know, during that yeah. time, boom, yeah. it, it, was, it, was, it was going down every which way you go. So... You know, with certain days we couldn't leave off the porch. Some days we couldn't go outside. Uh, then if it was something happened in my neighborhood, ten cents out of ten, my family was involved with it. Yeah, you know, yeah. we didn't. We, I didn't grow up in like a a big neighborhood per se. You know what I'm saying? We was kind of isolated to ourselves. Like my when my grandmother moved where she moved, three of her sisters moved in the same location. So their kids and their kids came along too. So uh, that's pretty much how it was because we navigated. Our family navigated uh, from 37th to Northeast, to Newcomb on MLK, to First Street. So we've been in the Atlanta Street, First Street, South Capitol Street area for right. a few decades. Right. And that's why I said I wanted to get a visual coming out your house because I remember vividly back then when you go over Southeast, man, it was just like droves and droves of people on every corner. Like, it was like, you know, I'm from Northeast side, so we had people out but it wasn't every, every corn. It was every yeah. two corns, every day. Like, it was like a... Yeah, well, the, the historic redlining in D.C. created a lot, a lot of that, right? Okay. Where it put uh, people who couldn't afford to live anywhere else to certain quadrants of the city uh, piled on top of each other. Mm. And that's where the violence started sparking in with the, with the crime, with the drugs. You know how it was, Kirk first mm -hmm. hand. And the kids was really left, to, a lot of us was left to fend for ourselves, being as though a lot of the, the mass incarceration that crippled the black community that took a lot of the men out of the community as well. So it was, it was really a transition period for, for DC, not just Southeast, but DC as a whole. Right. And during all that time, did you, did you, it seemed like you was real isolated, nice night tent, uh, nice uh, insulated family, but did you ever come across any trouble times as far as with the law or, you know? Well, er early on, man, it just, it wasn't the fact that, see, God gave me a lot of gifts and people in my life that, that pointed me on the right track. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Powerful. Right. We were just talking about Murray and Bird. You know, I got to go back to Naughty, Mace, uh, Deron, 
Jay Bone, uh, Monty. Like it was certain people God put in my way to kind of stir me to the right track. When, even when I wanted to veer off, you know, I remember early on. Uh, shout out to Mr. Lou. I was uh, struggling right. economically in high school because right. I ain't had much, and I was leaning towards trying to get some money. I was thinking about going to the streets. Streets was easy for me because right. it was around me every day. Right. But I never really wanted to be in the streets. Right. Um, and so. Uh, I got caught up with stealing cars with my friends, just getting caught up with, with that. But I never was really in the system, you know. And when I did get caught one time by the police doing some stuff with the UUs, we was part of the first Kitty Car Thieves that came through DC mm. that was going from MLK Southeast Side all the way over to the Simple City area. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, uh, you know, I decided, man, I, I ran into some, a guy named Mr. Lou on MLK. Uh -huh. That's when we had beepers. I used to have a pager. Oh, yeah, 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 I used to have a pager, a green pager, man. Right. I didn't never pay my pager bill, and he beat me. Right. I thought it was one, a little girl in my school, you know. Right, right. Called, I called him, and he was like, man, I can see you keep walking past my store every day. You don't right. pay your bill. Mind you, I'm, I'm playing up number 11, so I'm going up there to play football. Right. But I'm walking past him. His store was called Players Page, right there by Players Lounge on MLK. Right. And he was like, man, what you need a job? And, and man, my bill was only $9 a month. Right, yeah, that's it. Well, you talking about all the way back. And I had to make a decision. Do I'm right. going to go on the streets right. and do this? Or am I going to go up here and sacrifice? And I think I was making $30 a week, huh? $30 a week. And I was working five days a week. And $30 a week. $30 a week, man. But I, that, I always say, man, if you can discipline yourself enough to go through one door, God will open so many other doors behind it. Because I met a guy named Jay Sun by working up there. And he was asking me, man, Trey, you, you want to um, go on BET? I'm like, BET? No, I don't want to go on no BET. I'm oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm chilling. I'm trying to survive out here. Right. And I, a little while later, I ended up seeing a commercial about Teen Summit on right. BET. Right, yeah. Teen and then Summit. I was like, man, I might do it. But, you know, I didn't quite know how to do it, what I was doing. So I went to the BET, John did the interview. Mm -hmm. And out about, I interviewed about 1,200 people and picked 15. I made, I made the squad. And I went to BET, but it started with me making a decision to go work into that work in that store. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that like that that really gave me a platform. It gave me introduction to uh, knowing my greatness of who I really am, and right. not really giving us the notion that I have to you know, get caught up in the drugs and the lifestyle to get to die in the streets. And so that was a really critical for me. Right, that's powerful. That speaks to your foundation. I, I speak a lot about foundation. Yeah. To juveniles and adults, so your foundation is real sturdy for you to be able to make a. A clear decision like that, that age like that, man, that speaks to you and your family. I was insulated. Like, right. you know, uh, my cousins didn't let, didn't allow me to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Like, even when I wanted to be all, they were like, man, get your ass in the house. Or, right. Man, you going to school. Right. It was already set for me. So right. it wasn't like like it is now. Like, a lot of the youngest is able to run rampant through the community, how they want to do what, what they want to do with no repercussions, no structure, right. and no chastisement. It wasn't like that for me. So I was blessed in that regard. Right. I know one thing, man. They said you got to... Right out the gate, you a hell of an entrepreneur for selling stuff. Oh, yeah. Coming up, man. Speak to that, man. Your entrepreneurial skills at a young age, man. Speak to some of the things you did. Yeah, man. man, I knew I didn't want to sell drugs, but I sold everything but drugs. <laughs> so, uh, I think it was probably like 11 to 12 years old. I, um, My uncle, Ronnell White, uh, he was the first person in my family to graduate from college. Okay. Um, he, he took me up to Florida Avenue, the little market up there. Okay, yeah. And I started buying stuff up there, bringing it back to the neighborhood right. and selling it. I was 12 years old. I used to ride my bike selling stuff. And I used to sell uh, cook cake, cupcakes, cookies, candy, right. you know, on the back of the truck right. with, with all with Travis and ears and all them. Right. So, you know, I always had a notch for just trying to make some money. Right. Cause I always wanted to, you know, I used to wear the joints and all, and all that because my, my, my mother couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. So we was going to get it how we get it. Right. And the streets wasn't the way for me, you know, so... So you learn. So you learn marketing, budgeting, inventory, all that. Just was, yeah. was it any entrepreneurs in the house before you? My uncle. My uncle had a business uh, that he imported stuff from Africa uh, called Images of a Doctor Color. So uh -huh. I saw him and I Juma running that business. So yeah, yeah. And he wasn't directly in my house per se all the time. I did live with him for a few, but that I always had a. I kept, you know, when you're young, big man, back then you used to see money. Like, I saw people with money every yeah. day, stacks and stacks of right. money, bro. Yeah. I was like, man, I got to get me some. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> I got to right. get me some of that. Right, right, yeah. Right. So, right. man, yeah. you're taking me back, man. Right, yeah, 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 yeah man. Because I say, man, I did my little 
that's the research. They say, man, trade, man. He yeah. might bring a refrigerator around this joint, oh, no man. Question. And, and sell and that joint, man. Sold first <laughs> day. <laughs> yeah, no question. I used to sell uh, headbands, refrigerate them back. That's when uh, DDTP was out. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Hobo. Right, all, yeah. all you know, madness, yeah. all days. That's right. back. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, it was really a DC thing back then, man. You said every day, man. Yeah. This is like, So, man, you you end up. Uh, I know your sports world was in Number Eleven Boys Club, which is a hell of a hell of a history of Boys Club. Yes, sir. But you making them teams over there. You must have some game, man, because it's deep as shit on Southeast, man. It's a lot oh, of no people. question. It's deep as shit. I know the basketball practice had to be about 50 dudes, man, to practice, man. Man, I had a coach named Renato Nada Gillis, man. Oh, yeah. And we had to, yeah, he had to cut you down. So what he do is, like, those who know number 11 basketball know you had to come through Naughty. Right. He'd make you do a 1,000 jumper jacks and 100 suicides every day till people start quitting. Yeah. Man, every day. So you, I'm saying people that's better than me. I'm going to say, even you got Tyler, don't matter. Oh, Tyler, don't matter. He going to set the tone. And we gonna be in shape, and we gonna win through through discipline, instruction, skill beyond time. I'm saying people better than me getting cut. So I was like, man. So yeah, yeah, it was like that, especially football. But yeah, it was, it, I, I know a lot of my childhood friends from across the city from playing little league mm -hmm. over the years coming up. So that that gave me a way out too, because back then, if you played sports, that kind of shielded you from the streets too. Right. You know, you got to right. pass. So right. yeah. And and that's universal. And I, and, I, and I again, I tell people that even in jail, even in penitentiary, dude can hoop. A hell of a joint, it kind of it kind of keep you out the way of a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? People, yeah. for some reason, that black thing in the basketball, yeah. it give you almost like a pass, especially yeah. for a guy. I, yeah, I played for, I graduated from Baloo. Yeah. I played varsity for Baloo my 12th grade year. Right. And I just remember a lot of stuff going on that year. Right. And a lot of the dudes who was affiliated with a lot of different neighborhoods that was really up in it real right. deep right. got passes, man. Right. They was able to go on and do some things in their life and not really have to make that move when, when, when it was going down. So I, I remember those days. And nowadays, it, it don't matter who you are. Right, yeah, it's, right. it's no rules, no structure. Right. It's a, it, we were just talking about it. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah man. We gonna touch on that too, further down the line. Yeah. You played Baloo, man. I know y'all ain't beat Spingarn, man. Yo, I'm a Spingarn nah, three, but y'all ain't nah, beat us. When, I know, when, yeah. When, when, uh, that's what, uh, you know, I don't know if you know Delano Hunter. Yeah, Delano. I, Delano I did played, yeah. he played with them when I uh, when I played. We never beat, but I had, I had 15 on Spingarn. Yeah, though, 15 yeah. on the Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, absolutely. Right. Check the books. All right, Delano, we got yeah, we got yeah. pull the books on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had a superstar on our team, Darl Morrow. Right, it was yeah. real good. We had a young guy, John Flood, Yella. Right. We had we had a pretty decent mob. We, we they won the championship that year. Yeah, I, I made a uniform. Oh, you know, okay. <laughs> Green you know, you know, speak our love now. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm okay. delaying on all of them, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They made, yeah, yeah you're right. Okay, yeah, okay. So high. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people don't know, man. You well, a lot of people might know, but you come off of high school. You was a three point five. Yeah. Coming out of high school. Well, I was uh, actually it was three three eight coming out of high school. Three eight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah three yeah. eight. And you end up going to college, what? Yep. Merle Easter Shore. Yep. Yep. And, yep. and 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 they say you did your thing down there. You end up graduating. What do they call it? Uh, cum yeah. laude. Magna cum laude. Magna cum laude. Guy. <laughs> I graduated the top fifty hey, percent Break that down, man. Tell who break that down. Who that is for my street listeners, man? <laughs> Explain what that is right there, man. So I mean, it was it was it was extremely difficult for me because of my freshman year. My foundation, my backbone was my grandmother. She passed mm. uh, December uh, of 2022. Right. And it, it shook my world. But I knew, one thing I did do, but I knew that I was trying to make her proud of me. Even right. before she passed, I used to, when I used to get scholarships and do things, I used to take her with me. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, um, and so when she passed, I committed myself. Me and my, my, I called my man, my brother Rodney. We said, we ain't leaving college until we graduate. And we we did everything from sleeping in cars to uh, being on Dang. RA. We just stayed committed, man, and we 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 end up getting out of there. And I didn't I didn't do much in college. I was a nerd, man. I was involved in like a lot of spiritual activities on campus. I probably went to two parties my whole four years, and one I went because I bought a lot of tickets. I was selling tickets, right, so right. I wasn't in. Like, yeah, yeah right. I was locked. I was locked in because right. the moment I left home, right. I had no bed to come back to. You know what I'm saying? It was no better. It was no home to come back to really outside of going to my uncle house out Merlin, and so I, I had to secede or secede, right. and I didn't have a lot of room to be BSing and playing around down there. There's a lot of dudes that was in school wanted to you know be street and do all that. I'm like, man, I could have did that in the southeast, man. Right. I come here to finish the cross the finish line, and then I end up gra graduated Madden cum laude. So you got summa cum laude was like a four four. 3.8 to 4.0. Mm -hmm. Then you got Man and Cum Laude. I think it's like a 3.6 to 3.8, something like the 3.7. Mm -hmm. And then you got Cum Laude, which is like, a, I guess, a 3.3 or 3.5. And 
you know. And so I did very well academically because I had to lock in. But what people don't know is that I struggled uh, with, uh, they said I, I went to P.R. Hurst, friendship, the original friendship, uh, home of the Falcons. And then my teacher told my grandmother that I had a learning disability. And my grandmother, you know what she said, man, that really changed my life, Kurt. She said, you're going to get your ass in that school and you're going to learn. <laughs> and though, that sentence right That's there, it. That, was it. that was it. That was it. Because she with no medication, with nothing of that. You get your ass in there, you're you going to learn. Right. And right. I, it made me believe in myself to believe I can do it. And so when I was able to transition from a 1.2 GPA mm-hmm. in middle school to a four, I ended up getting a 4.1 GPA in high school because I took AP classes. Mm-hmm. Shout out to God Daniel Blakeney who passed. Um, and it really allowed me to have my self-esteem and I can believe myself that mm-hmm. no, I can do it because she believed in me and my mother and my uncle, my family believed in me and they pushed me, you know what I'm saying? Right. So that was real big for me. Right. You spoke of the word self-esteem. Did, was there ever a time in your life that what your height get, uh, rattled your confidence on sports, women, street fight, anything or, or what? Absolutely not. Never. <laughs> never. You ain't never let it get in the way nah, of that. Nah, you can ask any of my coaches since I was eight, nine, ten. Yeah. I was always going to rumble with whoever, it no matter what size, what age. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm going smack at them. Okay. Right? Yeah, I ain't <laughs> never had that, Kurt. Okay, I always yeah. had a stream level of confidence. Right, you know? yeah. it, was, it was times where we was poor and I made mean, the dress like everyone else and that mm-hmm. affected me a little bit. But mm-hmm. as far as my ability to perform and right. believe in myself, right. Man, nah. Right. I always had that in me, and that allowed me to push past the stereotypes, the stigmas, uh, all those things to say I couldn't be. You know right. what I'm saying? Like when they right. talked about my learning disability and all that. Uh, man, that's the same guy that, right. that not only graduated from college, went on, I went to, went to became a council member, mm-hmm. law school. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, yeah. And was it is it true that you was while you was in college, you were coming home on weekends coaching football? Yeah. So, true story. My last year of high school, I wanted to coach, right? Mm-hmm. And so one of my former coaches, Coach Bill, was coaching at Woodland. They, I was, I'm from number 11, but a lot they, they shut down the 125 pound team and they mm-hmm. went to Woodland. Mm-hmm. And so Bill said I can come coach with him. Mm-hmm. So I went over there and coached my little brother played on the team. Mm-hmm. In fact, half of the team that I coached went to my school. Right. And I coached, uh, I was in 12th grade, they was in 9th grade. Right. And when I left, we lost five of those young guys on that team to, to homicide. The first one got killed in the cafeteria. That was James Richardson, J-Rock. He got killed in the cafeteria, Baloo. Then we had Pookie, which was uh, uh, from down Parkchester. Devin Folks, he got killed in Anacostia. Uh, Omar, Brandon. Uh, I can go down the list. It's, we, we lost 14 people from that one team of 25 kids during that time, man. And so... I told God, if you allow me to make it out, I'll come back and give back and dedicate my life to my community. And so for nine years, I came home every weekend during football season and coached Little League football. Damn, that's, yep, that, that, that's yep, what's up. Yep, yep, so, Damn, that's yep, what's up, man. Every weekend, bro. And, yeah. and, and, and just speaking what you just said, man, you, you, you actually can recite those guys' names off your head like that. Oh, that was man. your first year coaching. You end up, and we was going to speak about your nonprofit, your councilman. All the death you done seen personally. Yeah, yeah, that I'm yeah. saying not the death that you didn't know the people personally. I'm saying just even just your personal yeah. death. I mean, do you ever see therapy for that? Do you ever? Yeah, I go to therapy every Wednesday, eight o'clock, Kurt, eight oh, o'clock okay. a.m. Yeah, okay. it's been. It's been, I mean, my my therapist even says it's not healthy for me to even go to any visual referrals anymore because it lasts for me longer than it used to. Right. Like it's just, just recently, I went to a crime scene where a young lady I held her in my arms. Yeah. Because when our good men, we about the same age, got killed in an apartment mm. in the doorway. She was inside. Ne- this week coming up, I got to go bury her because she was killed a couple of days ago. This weekend. Yeah, today, Thursday, this weekend. So it, it never, it's never ending, man. It's a lot of trauma. And that, that, that it's about self-care for me because I don't know the long-term effects this has on my mental, but I know it affects me in various ways. And so... Uh, I'm not afraid to go to therapy. I'm not afraid to get it out because I know I hurt, man. It's a lot of pain and there's certain triggers mm-hmm. that happen along the way that trigger that pain from back in the day and seeing a lot of my friends, a lot of loved ones buried on them t-shirts, man. So, and I'm and as a council member, I'm active in the community each and every day on the front line. Right. And my therapist say, man, you can't keep doing that. And it's yeah. like, man, I don't know how not to. Right. So it's, it's very difficult. So, I mean, I'm proud that we able to build a workout where we have teams out in the streets now that respond to different families and, and so it's not just Trey on white all the time mm-hmm. and you know people don't appreciate that because they used to send me mm-hmm. i'm like nah we gotta delegate because it's too much you know for right. one for one person right. so 
Damn that man, that's good, man. That she was able to understand you need to talk to a therapist because where we come from, we think we can just rough everything off. Nah. You know what I'm saying? I think nah, rough everything you, off, man. Yeah, nah. You push it down long enough, it's gonna explode in some way, yeah. form or fashion. You never know who you're gonna hurt or how it may uh, manifest. I say I say if you don't deal with that pain, it deal with you. Right. Right. And we see a lot of things happen in the communities because uh, we, we experience a lot of trauma as kids, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, adolescents, young adults, adults, and we don't know how it's gonna manifest, man. Mm -hmm. And so we got to be conscious of how we move and dealing with being self-aware of our feelings, thoughts, and emotions. So. Mm -hmm. Damn, Shorty. I mean, you're not even, at this time, you're not even eight, not, can't be no longer 19. You done, you done tackle, uh, jump over all the hurdles of First Street, Southeast, uh, it was a lot of potholes and bed traps. <laughs> People jumping, you jumping all over them. Yeah. You go on Baloo, a school that was known for being active inside the building. Of course. The better alone outside the building. Stay with a 3.8. Go to college. I can't even pronounce what you what, yeah. what you had. You know what, I'm saying? <laughs> what you got, right? Yeah. Then you come home, man. You start you coaching. Then you you get into um, nonprofit. You start working. With, I guess before you got your own, you start working with uh, ERCPCP. Yeah, I started working with Reverend Isaac. Uh, Reverend Isaac uh, ran the church on my street. He used to be the youth pastor on my block. Right. Okay. And I was doing real estate appraisal when I first came home. Right. Um, in two thousand and six seven. Mm -hmm. And, I, and the market crashed about 2007, 2008. So mm -hmm. I was working non nonprofit with Reverend Isaac, ERCPCP on First Street, and I transitioned to start my own nonprofit. Right. Yeah. Let's see if you rest, man. You, give me those initials for that, man. What, what, what Hicks, they? helping. No, Hennessy. not your job. No, what's the ERCP? What's those initials? Yeah. Easter River Clergy Police Community Partnerships. Yeah, I think okay. I got it. I think Reverend I got Isaac, man. Yeah, right. That's what Reverend Isaac did. He forget this foundation, man. Yeah, that's what Reverend Isaac did. He forget this foundation, yeah, man. Right he he forget, he this foundation, man. So then you end up later on getting your own organization. Yep, yep. Speak to that. What's, what, 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 how you come up with the name? What was the name of What year did it happen? And how did you come up with that name? So I felt like, I mean, I was doing a lot of work. I was running like five different programs in five different communities. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I needed to formalize what I was doing because you know how it is. You you got a good heart to do a lot of good work, mm -hmm. but then people want to support what you're doing, but you you it's not formalized in a way that they can donate, mm -hmm. they can support. It's really no structure. Mm -hmm. I'm just, and I had I got married, so my mm -hmm. I, I was I was stressed so thin doing a lot of community work that I was becoming a public success, but a private failure. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Say it again, right? This is yeah, straight to Say it one more time. Like I, I was doing a lot of good things and getting recognized. I, I actually I got a award from President Obama. During that time, but in my home life was just discombobulated. I, I, my wife was divorcing me. I had just had a son. I was sleeping on my uncle's couch up, uh, out Maryland. I was on my mother's couch up Parkland. It was just a troubled time for me, but people can, couldn't see it because I was out, you know, every day active, helping people change their life, but inside, and I was, I was struggling. I couldn't, you know, my car tags was dead. Right. I ain't had no money. Right. I was struggling, man, fighting depression. It was, it was really tough during that season, but. And you said a public success, but a privately fella. Yeah. And yeah. You need to patent that, man. Yeah. Man. That's 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 that can fit a lot of shoes right yeah, there, man. Yeah. They can fit a lot of shoes. So man, and before we go ERCPCP, we need to I need to recognize the people that's doing work with it right now with the Anthony Pete, uh, Pete, yes, uh, uh my man, Pete. uh Mike, big uh, big Mike Plummer, okay. uh big man Eric Robinson, Katrina uh, Davis, man, so on and so on over there, man. Uh, shout out to the work they doing stand in the community, man. So you end up getting your own organization, man. What's a Hicks? Yeah, you remember? Yeah, yeah back man. In the day. So yeah, so man, P, I'm gonna let you introduce Hicks. What's the, what's the initial for? I don't know. I'm gonna get that one on, man. Helping inner city kids succeed. Succeed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Good, man. How, how good, I know man. that name is because the man hired me to be a mess, uh, a mentor. That's right. To uh, some of you folks, some yep, man. man. That's I, the good hey, days, man. Hey, hey. Man, hey look. That's the good old days, man. Hey, man look, I walked in yeah. that joint. I say, man, Shorty got his own. <laughs> Little organization. I think the first week was over 15, over a license lane oh, yeah. in a little church over there, right? Yeah. They yeah. came over there, man. Yeah, because it's crazy, man. Because I was doing, I've been doing unstructured mentoring all my life, yeah, right? Yeah, gotcha. So I say, man, I really want to get in and see from a, from a uh, you know, a structure standpoint. Yeah, right? I remember that, man. And, yeah, and I walk in there, man, and, and you showed them, man, open me with open arms, no man. Question. No yeah, question. Yeah, man. So, so talk about Hicks, man. So uh, Hicks really started. Um, both my uh, me and my cousin. Actually, it's crazy how it started because I was in real estate, as I told you. And one day, me and my cousin Skip was coming home from a conference, and, it, and my cousin and them kept calling me, kept calling me. It's like one of the youngest on my football team had came around my way and pulled out a Mac on everybody, like looking for one of my little cousins. So we like we went away. We pull up, 
by the time we pull up, they pull back up. Mm. Man, whip, whipped out again. Like, but he didn't get out the car when he saw me, but the other guys did. And we was just under, we, we, man, him and I was like, man, we got to do more than what we're doing for these youngins. Because we was coaching football, but it was like, we, they, we was winning football games, but we was losing in life. You get right, what I'm saying? Like, right. the, the, what we was giving them wasn't enough just about football and athletics, man. Mm-hmm. We had to really deal with character. Mm-hmm. We really had to deal with manhood, self-esteem, mm-hmm. even even taking a shower, the basic stuff right. they wasn't getting at home and make sure right. they adequately fed. And so him and I uh, and my wife at the time started the nonprofit. And then with Tim Donnie and Ja came mm-hmm. and we really formalized it and really built it up to what it was during that time. Yeah, it was a journey. And at that time, when you when you first started the preliminary, how was you able to get funding? Was you was you get donate? How you how you live? We ain't had no funding. That's why I'm trying to tell you. I quit working for ERCBCP. I started my own nonprofit, and I started off doing. I was already doing the work. Mm-hmm. And it's like you know how it is. You working with a younger. You think you got five younger, but that young got a cousin, got a right. brother, got a friend. Yeah. He want to come along. Yeah. So five youngers turning to fifty youngers right. real yeah. quick. Real fast. And they needy. And so. We struggled. I started giving out my pockets. I had no more to give, you know. Um, and so I started using my network to kind of apply for grants and build a foundation, get an accounting, uh, like formalize the executive, you know, form a real, real business. Because right. people think nonprofits is doing it. Nah, it's a real business, right. man. You can get in trouble if you don't do it right. right yeah. And so I did that and, and built, and God breathed on it, man. And a lot of people blessed me, man. I made a lot of good connections, man. Mm. And, I, and I grew it. Right. And for somebody out there who started a nonprofit, just started a new one, can you give us like one or two uh, recommendations how they can go after some funding? Yeah. Or, or ideas to start some funding? So first, I mean, the reality is you start a nonprofit, you got to have a strong vision for what you want to do, man. Okay. Because people come to me saying they want to do this and this, and I ask them how they're going to do it. They aren't, they aren't able to articulate it. You got to realize that you got to have a business. You got to apply right. for a 501c3. You got to have a board. You got to have a strong board. Uh, and you gotta have a person that's gonna write grants for you, mm-hmm. you know. And you gotta have a, somebody who can manage money. That's, that's how people key. get in trouble because you right. can get the money but if you don't use it right. right. You be in worse trouble than what you started right, with. Right, right. And it's really, you know, I always say, man, lead in love. Like people who don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And, and the need is out there, and it's great. And once you get going, don't be afraid to partner because we're in a crab and a barrel mentality in this community when it comes to nonprofits because it's a small pot of money that everybody arguing and fighting scratch over. Mm-hmm. But it's like if you partner, you're stronger because mm-hmm. the heart don't do what the hand do, the leg don't do what the arm do. And so I realized that at a younger age, mm-hmm. and I started realizing the strengths in people. That's you know that's how I end up meeting you and working with you because I feel like you had some uh, worth in this work, mm-hmm. who you are and what you represented, and, and so on, and other people in, 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 in work too. And so I was never shy about sharing uh, the wealth for or, or or the work, you know. Right, yeah. Right. But I know one thing, you drop a lot of jewels. I gotta remember something. Good thing we record you, man. You, you drop yeah. you drop jewels all over the place, man. Yeah. I'm serious, man. So you you doing your nonprofit work, you building, man. I'm like I actually got a chance to see. Cause I'm kind of a little a little biased when it comes to you, cause I seen the beginning process, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's funny because even when I was speaking to some people before I came over, uh, actually a, a police officer and a war eight resident. I was like, man, I'm going to interview Trey and everything. You know, man, he don't. Why we yet when this person got killed? I said, man, you know, if he told, if he gave how many scenes he been on, that's why I actually heard about the therapy piece. I was like, there's no way in the world you been running on them my scenes. Job, man, I'm not a police officer yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or a firefighter, right, you know, right, but I right. do it because I try to be there for the families and right. then I try to make sure I make sure it don't escalate. Try to provide supports, but I can't. There's no way possible I can I right. respond to all crime scenes. You right, know what I'm saying? right. I'll be there all day. We had a shooting today, matter of fact. So right. yeah, come on, man. Yeah, that's what I say, but I'm like, I'm saying, yeah, I, ain't nobody. I don't know nobody in DC as active as me in right. politics. Right, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's like it's a catch twenty two. You know, right. you just gotta it, praise and rejection are two sides of the same coin. You can't right. accept one without accepting the other. You right. know, when you become right. a leader, you're on the front line. You gotta take the good and the bad. Right. So I just take it on the chin. Right, man. So speaking uh, speaking of that. What what prompts you? Well, obviously for your journey, but what what made you make the decision that I'm gonna run for councilman? Oh man! So I was on the school board before I was a councilman. Right. Okay. So it was a, uh, one of my former mentors. People know that I was mentored by Marion Burry, right, yeah. but a lot of people may not know I was mentored by William Lockridge. Okay. William Lockridge was one of the first people that got me involved in policy. He was on the school board. Okay. And he he was a strong advocate for civic empowerment and getting mm-hmm. people from the community engaged civically in their own community. Mm-hmm. And um, one day I was at a, at a game, that's when Oak Hill was Oak Hill. Mm-hmm. And I had some kids in Oak Hill playing football. I went to the championship, yeah, they yeah. played uptown. 
and he walked up to me and he put his hands over my eyes when I was at the game. I turned back, you know, I don't play, right, I, I'm right. small, don't, don't get right. up on me, don't right. touch me, right. I don't play right. like that, right. you know? Right. Right. You know, respect my space. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, turn, I'm turning around real aggressive, I'm like, man, hold. Right. He like, I, I'm, I see him, but it's like, yeah, it ain't right. registering. Yeah. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know who he is. Right. I'm like, do he know who I am? Because I, I, I know Mr. Lockridge. Right. Man, he helped my little brother graduate. My little brother was in jeopardy and I graduated. Mm-hmm. And my little brother and his friends. And he was like, man, he had a dream. He said, I had a dream about you. I'm like, yeah, I had a dream about you. I'm like, ho, oh, man, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a dream. I'm like, yeah, I had a dream about you. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what? <laughs> So he's like, man, I need to talk to you. But it's a football game going right, on. You have right, a, a right. real live moment. And little did I know, as I built with him for like a year and a half after that, mm-hmm. that we went to a meeting. That's when Sekou Biddle was going against Vincent Orange. Mm-hmm. And they was trying to get the seat for uh, the council member seat mm-hmm. when Kwame was gone. And he told me to meet him down there. And I met him down there. We talked the next He told me to call him the next day. But he always say call him, but he don't be answering. He had a right. Blackberry. Don't right. never answer his right. phone. Right. I called him, he answered. I talked to him for like an hour and a half, Kurt. And he was telling me he wanted me to run for a school board seat. Mm-hmm. I was like, man, I don't do politics. I'm like an activist, right. man. Right. Politics, man, that ain't really my thing. You right. know what I'm saying? I'm right. also a street fighter. I'm from yeah. the trenches. And I didn't tell him yeah, but I didn't tell him no. But I was like, ah, that ain't really my thing. Mm-hmm. I fell asleep. I got a call from Nate Ben and Fleming. And a lot of people was calling me. And I got a phone call that when I woke up that he went into a coma that night. Mm. And he never made it out, he passed. And I was right. like, damn, I was my whole world was shit. Cause he was like a father to me. Like, it's, it's like I knew him for like a little bit. I felt like I knew him for a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And I guess about two to three weeks later, his wife, mm-hmm. Wanda Locker, said she was sitting on the couch next to him when he asked me to run for his seat when he retired. And so his seat was about to be up because it was a special election. He asked me would I run in his honor. Mm-hmm. I was like, how can I say no? You know right. what I'm saying? I said, I figure I'll run, I probably won't win. Right. And I put a little team together, we ran, we won. Like from the straight out the mud, the no political experience, no man. I remember they saying we was thugs. People had on do rags. It was just, they were saying people was going to post smelling like weed. It was a lot of ridicule. Right. But man, you know what what God got for you gonna be for you. Right. You know what I'm saying? You just gotta stay stay in that mode. And I've been in that vein for quite some time. I, that's what would get me started in politics to answer right. your question. And right. then a council member eventually, you know, right. connected with Marion Bird. And, and, and the first time you ran for council member, you lost. Yep. How'd that feel? It was devastating, man. Oh, it was yeah. devastating. It's one of the worst feelings I I can feel. But one, one, one thing about me, I don't give up. Right. I learned a long time ago, you can't conquer anything you're not committed to. Right. And I felt like they cheated me. Right. Right. Because yeah. I feel like we had more votes than all of them. But they said we had, you know, if it's within one percent by the law, they got to do a recount. Right. They said that was like at one point three percent, so they right. couldn't do a recount. But I had to pay for a recount. Right. And I asked them how much I had to pay. They said seventeen thousand, Kurt. I ain't, I raised less less than seventy thousand the whole campaign. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Man, yeah. No way possible. Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So I was like they 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 worked me. Right, know yeah, what I'm yeah. I never forget, man. Yeah. You came, you had a bag of green hats. Probably about three hundred. Oh yeah, you just had one. Yeah, about three hundred green hats or two. You was like, man, I'm trying to get some of my brother on there, but then he said, he said, man, I'm getting I'm getting some funding right yeah. now for this running the George. We just ran the George, right? So yeah. you, had, you had a whole set of that. The man racing. That's a lot of information man, down there. Hey, Trey R. White, it. Center, it Center, it. Red and Blue, right? Yeah. Like, I'll hold the break, man. man so I, see I you. appreciate that. You did them hats. Did, did, did I think you did some more hats for me. You just like Trey. Yeah. I still got to get paid for my hats, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, man. I was best thinking I was like hot kicks yeah. every Yeah, man. Every I went, man. Well, look, yeah. your dedication, man, is yeah. un- unwaving, man. And, and I'm just, and just hearing your journey, man, from your grandmother uh, to the guy that, you know, passed away, Lockridge. Um, it show you, it's, like I tell people, you if you watch a person foundation, mm-hmm. you pretty much can can pinpoint them, right? So your your dedication and perseverance is crazy, man. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy, and it show all the way to where you at now, right? Yeah. But I just want to highlight that because I'm thinking that in my head. But you end up running again, and you beat the people. Mm-hmm. How you feeling in victory? Oh man, <laughs> it's almost you want to show off, but you can't. You gotta right, stay right, humble, right, you know? right, 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 right. Uh, but I think that God, like, it worked because when Murray and Bray passed, his son was in the race, Chris Bray. Right. And no, Chris Bray' real name was Murray and Bray. So a lot of people felt like they wanted to support me, but they wanted to support his son. His right. father just passed, you know. Right. And, uh, and and it was crazy because one day I woke up. And Chris Burry was on the news talking about he endorsed Trey Arnold. Wasn't even no election going on. He said he endorsed me for council member. There was no election going on. We both had lost that race. We had to wait till the 18 months of new race. And he endorsed me. 
And I was like, "This is what? What's Chris doing?" But right. that's how he was. Right. Little did I know that Chris was going. Chris died before the election. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so it's certain things that happened divinely. I couldn't ask for even playing. And so when that happened, uh, a lot of people supported me because they felt like they, they cheated the real people in D.C. Because right. the person I ran against raised in, in two elections raised five hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I think total we ended up raising in both races like sixty thousand dollars. So it was like the money machine versus the people. Right. And so we played on that nerd to you. Like right. we can't be bought. Like is right. war they for sale? Where, right. where, where y'all going? Where y'all at? Right. So right. it was that type of thing we ran, and people knew I had a genuine heart, you know, right. for God's people. Because like you said, the work I've been doing prior to anybody knowing me mm-hmm. for a long time, I went on a major platform. I was just working in the trenches for right. at least ten years prior to. Right. So yeah. Right. So they gave you the keys to go open the door to the councilman office. Yeah. You left the school board. When you got there, you ain't really know about the school board. You just went on. Divine. Absolutely nothing. When you got in there for the councilman, over there, did you know anything about that? Yeah, I kind of did because I used to spend time with Burry down the city okay. hall. You okay. know, I got even got pictures. I'm on the dais behind Burry, sitting in the chair. Yeah. I should be down there. Um, but even even when you get in the seat, it's still different because you the guy now, right. right? So everybody, everyone calling you, pulling on you, asking you. And when, and it's a, it's a double edged sword because if, if their life don't change instantly, and it's like, damn, you was the hope. What happened? It's like we didn't get here. Overnight, so it's not going to change overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's about really me galvanizing people and making them be a, being a part of their own story and success. That mm-hmm. one person not going to change the dynamics of our community that's been devastated, neglected for over 30 years. It's about us right. collectively fighting for power mm-hmm. and influence and equity in this budget mm-hmm. together. And so that's the type of campaigns I run, that's the type of uh, meetings I have, that's the type of leadership I have, like inclusiveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. So, man, and you, you doing the counseling thing, man, you over there. Everywhere you on you on marches on on marathons on crime scenes passing out food. Yeah, I even see a lot on, on outside of War Eight and War Five and War Seven two oh, yeah. events and stuff like yeah. that, right? So that's just like a camaraderie with other councilmen, or just you paying homage to the city. When I see your other events, what that be about? Well, people feel like I'm I'm, I'm the DC guy. Okay, and then people be like, man, you always in suffrage. You don't come up here, right? But it's like, man, I'm the War Eight council member, and we got enough work to go around. Right. You know, we got enough work for three council members in War Eight, right? And so there are instances where I do cross the line and go to other wars because you know I feel like. Uh, people are calling me, and I don't want to just get normal if I can help them. You know right. what I'm saying? I don't, want, you know, so I have to pick and choose because the the the, the load is heavy. Right. We have some of the highest health disparities, mm-hmm. wealth disparities, mm-hmm. income inequalities, mm-hmm. uh, homicides. Mm-hmm. Uh, you name it, we got it. And right. so my plate is full. But sometimes, you know, people call me, and I I can't just say no, man, because right. it'd be on my heart. It'd be a burden to me. So I got to get up, get dressed, and go up there, man, right. and make something happen. So depending on where it is. And recently, in the last mayor race, you decided to run for mayor. What, what prompted that decision? It was crazy. Um, I wasn't even going to run for mayor. Okay. What happened was, I was always arguing with the administration about different things I feel like wasn't happening. Okay. Because for a long time, for like seven years, there was no money in the budget to deal with the violence and crime in the community okay. because the administration, the mayor, was saying that crime was down. Mm-hmm. It was like, man, I was doing three to four visuals and frontals a week. I'm mm-hmm. like, so in Ward 8, I mean, I remember Phil Pinnell, uh said it, but we was like, yeah, crime is down, down the street, <laughs> around the corner, <laughs> in our schools, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, in our neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And so we started changing the, nar- changing the narrative. And I just said, I'm getting tired of arguing back and forth about what can be done for my city. Like, it's my city. Right. I'm really from here. Mm-hmm. I'm born in the greatest Southeast Hospital, you know, mm-hmm. Dr. Charles Lloyd. You know, right, like, right. man, I'm really from here. And I just felt like, man, I can't. So what happened was, Mary Bowser announced she was running. Another councilman, Robert White, said he was running. Mm-hmm. So when he announced, it was online, and people, a lot of people didn't know Robert White. So he was like, Robert White, what happened to Trayvon White? They was really right. saying Trayvon White. What happened right. to Trayvon White? Right. So the com people was at me in the comments. Right. So I was, so I commented. I said, man, what's up? They was like, man, you running? I said, let's go. I had to put some comment right, on it. Right, right. So, so then the next thing I know. They had ran a news story that I was running for me. I was just commenting on, a, on an right, Instagram. Right, right. So my mother called me. She's like, you ain't tell me you was running for me. I said, what? She said, it's on the news. I said, what? Right, right. So I was like, well, let's go. <laughs> right, right. Let's turn up. Hey, they fight you over. You ain't never ducked for a fight, I ain't huh? ducked no record. I promise you. <laughs> so 
That's how. That's really how it started. So right. you know, people got a little salty. Even Robert White, you know, we he, we talked it through. He was a little salty. Right. He felt like I, I snubbed his chance or whatever. Right. But I'm like, man, this is my city, man. I can't expect nobody to do for me what I can do for myself. Mm. You know. Mm. Um, and so I ran. You know, I was unsuccessful, but right. you know, when you know me, I I, I stay at it. Right. Stay, yeah. Stay, stay at it, man. Middle line, say, keep your hands up, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name? Let's just let's just. Uh, uh, Say you won the mayor. This what was the first thing on your list you would have done? The first thing you would checked off on your list, one of your big I know you had a lot that you would have done. What was the first thing you would have done? First thing I would have done is bring everybody back together, especially those who ran, you know. Right. Right. Uh because it, policies become divisive. Right. A divisive in a in a in a place where, you know, you people choosing teams and all that. And reality is we we can't get to a finish line unless we together, man. Mm -hmm. We're strong. It's, it sounds cliche as we're actually strong at together. Mm -hmm. And it can be very contentious and divided. You know, people choosing sides because they got grants over here, or they got a contract over here, or that's their cousin, or that's I grew up with him or her. And so first thing all they did is try to have a kumbaya moment to bring everybody together, let them know I'm the leader. Right. But we all on the same team. We right. like, we got to get to this goal together. Right. We can't get I can't get here by myself. Right. Um. So I always try to do that mm -hmm. to try to bring everybody together. But then you know, crime, man. We we uh, crime out of, out of control in the city right now, man. We. We got the we we had the highest crime in the last two years. We had in the last twenty years. Mm. You know, you see what's going on, mm -hmm. yeah. and so that's one of the first things we tried to tackle. I, I actually on the council, people talk about going to crime scenes, but just re, the, in the reality is, I'm uh, myself along with Kim McDuffie uh, was the first people that fought to get money in the budget to address violence in D.C. Right. Prior to me, there was zero dollars in the budget to fight crime in D.C., zero. Mm. It wasn't no violence interrupters going on. It wasn't no cure the streets. It wasn't nothing in place. Mm -hmm. And we tapped Cora, saying he put some money in, Murray Bowser put some money in. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even no one's office in D.C. Right. And so we had to change the narrative and, you know, and really get some people on the ground because at first they were saying that we was paying ex-cons not to commit crime when we tried to hire returning citizens. Right. Right. And so... Uh, we had to change that narrative, and you know, I've done a lot of other things. Like we building the state, it was like we won't have no trauma center in Ward Eight. Right now, we building the state of the brand new hospital, yeah, okay. right smack in, in Southeast Washington, yeah. in Ward Eight on St. Elizabeth campus. You know, we built two grocery stores in Ward Eight. You know, they're struggling right now. Uh, we uh, put money in the budget to build four new recreation centers in Ward Eight. Yeah. One is already standing up right now, and two breaking breaking ground in the next couple of months. And so we've done some things in the ward. I said I was gonna do when I ran. You know, just not talking to talk or or just active at crime scenes. Right. Nah, I got to do some more legislation. Right. I uh, passed legislation that gave over 5,000 people their license back. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I did a ticket amnesty bill, which I'm going to have to do again because it's out of control right, with right, these right, tickets. Right, right, Lord right, have mercy. Right, right. But it's some of these non-traditional things that I do that people don't know, you know, because mm -hmm. people don't pay attention to a lot of legislative pieces and stuff right. like that, but that's my job. Right. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. You said something about the, the uh, when you run for, because I know, I never was a, a, a Political guy understood all the landscape of it, right? Yeah. I just, I know, I deal with these people, right? And it's like, and it's crazy because every time you be like, say, if I'm, if I'm in the club talking to you, then you might see somebody else say, man, I don't mess with him because he mess with Trey on. Then you might be somewhere to eating dinner with somebody, and somebody speak, take a picture. So why is it so, why is it so divisive in the, uh, in the, why is it looked at that you can't communicate with certain people or have personal relationship with people? Why does it look like that in the politician world? It ain't, it ain't the politician world. It's just people in the, that's just people in general, man. Right, it, right. It's politicians world too, but it's just spilling over. That's like right now we got Youngers beefing because he in a rap song with this guy. Right. And they right. saying you with the ops, so right. y'all want to shoot him because he doing an album with it. It ain't just part. Right. It's, it's dynamics of of, of 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 a slave mentality. Okay. Right. Okay. And it, and, it, and it manifests in different fields, but it's the same thinking, man. Right. And we have to be confidence to confidence and self aware enough to know that, man. Just because this person is affiliated with this person, mm -hmm. don't mean it. Like uh, I heard, I heard, I heard you said you was you, was, you did an interview uh, on, on on one of the platforms. Mm -hmm. You was like people was saying you was affiliated with somebody who was a rat. You was like, I know pedophiles and rapists. That don't mean that got nothing to do with me. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People in there thinking, right. small-minded people right. can't think above, you know, right. a holistic person and can't stand on their own. And so they people got to assimilate to fit in or to fit, seem to fit in to kind of right. get get ahead. And so it manifests in politics in different ways. But the reality is Dr. King said something that was so crucial. He said, we, got, we, we must learn to have unity or be non-existent. Mm. 
And we move in a place in, in D.C. where we talk about gentrification all the time. Now nah, we're in a place now where we talk about genocide, man. Mm. Because we have some of the highest health disparities per capita in the country as least to African Americans in D.C., right? We dine at alarm rates when it comes to uh, infant mortality rates, health disparities, homicides, mm -hmm. suicides, mm -hmm. drug abuse, mm -hmm. overdoses. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of elements that's eating away at us every day, so we can't afford to be divided right now. Right. Yeah, the Speaking population of blacks is shrinking. We used to be Chocolate City. Right. We didn't went from over 70% to less than 50%. Right. Yeah. And that leads me to my next question. What's your thoughts on the gentrification, the whole process of it? And what's well, going on? I, I, I feel like if we don't do something drastic right now to turn it around, mm -hmm. then it's going to get increasingly worse for black people, man. This mm -hmm. Right now, we're in budget season in D.C. where we just received the budget from the mayor. We, You got to think about it like this, and most people don't know this. Like We have an emergency fund called ERAP. Emergency, emergency Rental Assistance Program. It's designed to help people who are struggling with their rent. Historically, we spent almost $40 million in eight months. Mm -hmm. Now we have $8 million for a whole year. Mm -hmm. We spent $8 million in two, three months. Right. So how are we going to have $8 million for 12 months? Right. And so you see the housing prices in D.C. is skyrocketing right. and the income is not aligning with those, with those prices. Mm -hmm. And so we building the D.C. that's not for people that don't have no money. It don't matter what color it is. And in D.C. it's known that the wealth gap between blacks and whites is, is at 81% higher for white families than black families. Mm -hmm. And so this is the nation's capital where it's expensive to live, man. And so we're going to come together and build some bridges using government resources and programs. Like uh, I was talking to, to Jaha mm -hmm. and Tone and Tone White the other day, man, man. And we were joking about it was some developers. They were saying they needed money from the government. Okay. And they was laughing because I told them that you asking for welfare. Like, y'all shun people who get public assistance right. and welfare. But right now, you guys want some welfare from the government. <laughs> right, right, it's the right. same thing. Right, same, right. Y'all right. enriching y'all sales, man. Right, right. And so, and so we had, we was joking about that. But the reality is, like, there are so many things set up to help different people. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to our people, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, we can't do that. Or it's mm -hmm. too weird. And we, I was thinking about when Murray and Bruce had that, like the MBE program helping right. minority businesses, yeah. right? During that time, I was around, and the DC budget was about eight billion. Mm -hmm. Right now, Kirk, the DC budget is nineteen point seven billion. So what are we talking about? Like, come on, man. Right, right. Like we can, we we doing less when we got more, and it ain't going. I'm not gonna let that just ride like that. And so we fighting two for nails with the with the count with my council colleagues, with the mayor trying to make sure we push a pass equality. We pass equality. We talking about equity. We need more because historically we got less. Hmm. And I was just talking to Kirk about Murray and Burry and how he set the precedence to say that nah, we gotta give people a chance, man. Not with a hand out with a hand with a hand up because yeah. somebody did that for us along the way. Yeah. I know they did for me. Yeah. I wouldn't be here just because uh, osmosis. Mm -hmm. God divinely divine sent people in my way and in my path to give me a, a way out. Mm -hmm. And I promise God I'll never leave it. I continue to work in this community until I can't work no more. Yeah, you do, you holding your end up. I'll tell you that, man. man. You hold your end up, man. <laughs> with, 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 the, what's any, um, with the truancy, man, and the junior highs and high school and all that, any, yeah. any ideas on how to tackle that? What, what's some of the things you think can help with that? Man, schools ain't really ain't really keeping kids entertained no more, man. Mm -hmm. Man, it's at a place where, you know, it's a certain way you can... First of all, we moved a lot of the historically African-American teachers from the schools, right? Yeah. Let's just say what the truth is. Yeah. We closed down over 22 schools mm -hmm. in the last 16, 17 years, right? Mm -hmm. Say we wasn't closing them down, we was consolidating to bring more resources to school. Mm -hmm. Yet we had a place where the schools still don't have resources. Right now, I'm fighting right now because... 22 schools in my ward is slated to get less funding than they had last year with almost the same kids they had last year mm. on a budget with a $19.7 billion budget. Yeah, we, if we don't build a strong foundation to education, that's the bed, the base of any strong community, education. Right. right? And, 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 and this is my, my ward. We're talking about there's over 70 some schools throughout the district that's going to be underfunded next year. Right? And if we not innovate them teaching trades, teaching skills, mm -hmm. teaching something they can, you get, we gotta begin and with the end of mind. They gotta know once they graduate, they got a place in DC. Mm -hmm. DC is graduating almost 30% of their kids out of high school in four years. 9% mm -hmm. graduated from college. Then you gotta think about DC is the second most degree place in the United States. So we got people coming here to go to Howard, American University, mm -hmm. UDC, Trinity, uh, GW. Mm -hmm. And some of these people staying here competing for the job market with indigenous people here are trying to find their way. Right. 
And so we have to be, we know what's going on, but we have to build the systems and the education system to fix, to cut in, mm-hmm. to say, man, if we know that the hospitality industry booming, we need to do a hospitality schools. Yes. And mm-hmm. shout out to Thomas Penny, they've done a lot of that in, in, in some of the schools along the way, but it's not to a place where we are putting all our resources behind our kids and showing they got a future here in the city. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, man, they, we imploding on each other. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's powerful, man. What, what do you tell a young kid that's hanging in the community, chilling around his way, and he encounter a very aggressive <laughs> cop that being aggressive uh, verbally and physically? What, 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 what do you tell him to do? How do you handle that situation? The one thing I tell him, man, you can't win in the streets. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm a victim of police brutality. Mm-hmm. I was hospitalized twice and assaulted by a police officer twice. I had, had a sue DC twice. Uh, after being a, a victim of uh, police brutality. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm 5'2", five, five, five feet 2, mm-hmm. probably 130 pounds soaking wet, so I don't pose no physical threat. I don't, mm-hmm. I'm not in the streets, you know what I'm saying? And it happened to me, so I can imagine what's happening every day. Mm-hmm. But I tell the youngest, because we're, we're in the social media age where you want to record, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of taunting with the police, but I'm just telling the youngest, man, you, you can't win in the streets. You got to beat them in court. Right. And you got to think before you move. And so. Not all the times that's happening. I just did went to a funeral of a young man. Uh, it was a Saturday. He was killed by park police over there in Northeast. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in the car, pulled all the police, shot him in the back multiple times. Mm-hmm. And so you know, it's it, we facing some new dynamics in the city where it's, mm-hmm. it's been happening, right. but it's being caught on camera now. Right. And if not, somebody recording. Then we got body worn, body worn, body worn cameras that's capturing it. Mm-hmm. And so I say to them, man, <clears throat> listen. Know your, know your laws, because if you don't know your laws, you don't have any. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it's a, we in information age, mm-hmm. but we got the, the information we need to get us to the next level on our phone and in our pocket. Right. But most of us ain't reading, and most of us ain't, they say you want to have something from a black man. Put it in the book. Put it in the book, man. Because yeah. most of us ain't even going to open it and read it, man. Yeah. So I try to, for me, I try to empower them to know, the, know who they are personally. Mm-hmm. And you know, cause a lot of youngers crashing cause they don't know their true potential mm-hmm. and they don't know what they can do in the future. So they just thinking about the here and now. You know how it is when right. you're young. Yeah. You in yeah. the mix, you in the flow, you just trying to, you just trying to survive. Mm-hmm. And so I try to tell, try to inspire them that there is a future beyond if you can see yourself getting there. Right. But there's no vision mm-hmm. that people perish. And so I got to try to give them vision. Right. I, I run a, I run a, uh, a foundation now. I work in two middle schools, Kramer. Mm-hmm. And Johnson, okay. you know, I also do. I just we just started a ministry inside of DC jail as well, mm-hmm. um, with some of the um, some of the brothers. So I mean, we it's it's a struggle, Kurt. Right. You know how it is. Right. Yeah. Define in your eyes what is a bad cop and what is a good cop. <laughs> what is a bad cop and what is a good cop? Well, it's all it's always in every profession you gonna have good people and bad people. Great. It don't matter you working at the DMV. If you street cleaning or you working right. inside, the, yeah. if you're teaching the school, right. yeah. uh, the reality is that a lot of the, the bad cops make it bad for the good cops, right? Yeah. right? Um, and people lose trust. And I had this conversation. Um, I had this conversation the other day with a, with a white shirt. We had a. I, I was um I was in, I was on Livingston Road walking my kids to the park, mm-hmm. and I sent my family home. Well, I was talking to some guys out there when they got up the street, all I heard was gunshots going. Mm-hmm. I hopped in my car, run around there, and it was just they was shoot it was a shootout going back and forth. And the cop was saying one thing that was inconsistent with what the uh the grandmother was there telling me what was going on. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, she know cause she was here, man. You got here after me. Right, right. And I was just telling him, like, even in this situation as a superior officer, you gotta have some cultural sensitivity to the community mm-hmm. and be able to hear what they saying because she could have died. Now, mind you, this grandma got her, her grandkids coming up. They going, they going to hang her. They thought their grandmother got shot. Yeah. And I was like, it's a certain way you got to handle this community. And because what you do in moderation, they going to do access. Right. And you seen as a white shirt, they expect you to. And he did well. He ended up handling the situation. But I had to put him to the side mm-hmm. and we talked through it. And some of the things he said was right. Mm-hmm. And some of the things they were saying in the, from the community side to me wasn't accurate because they had everything on camera. I didn't right. know that at the time. But right. it's sometimes you got to be patient, let everything play out. But sometimes these officers are too aggressive. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You being aggressive with the with these young guys, or even the girls. The yeah. girls turning up too. Mm-hmm. They gonna be aggressive back. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and, and so I define a, a, a good cop as an officer that really care. Mm-hmm. See, one thing we gotta do in DC, we gotta hire more people from DC mm-hmm. to work in DC. Right. Right. 
more than half of our police force don't live in D.C., never lived in D.C., and don't really have the empathy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for for the residents of D.C., and I think that's a problem. Right. Um, I actually like the new police chief, uh, Conti. You know yeah, Conti? Yeah, he grew up right Yeah, he's from your... Yeah, he's he, solid, Oh, yeah, man. no, good dude. He's he going to come. Oh, he's going to yeah, come? I watched yeah, him, I watched him grow up. Yeah, so I think that's critical that you got uh-huh. that. We find in D.C., we got a lot of people who lead in D.C. that's not from D.C., right. and so I'm happy that we have a police chief in D.C. that came mm-hmm. through public housing. Right, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Came from around your way yeah, in the streets. Yeah, I street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I street northeast. Yeah, that's uh, special. Twenty uh, first. So we need guys like him to understand who he elevating the leadership right. to help deal with the, the the culture and the climate of what's going on in the streets. Right. Man, you can't always match five with five, right. and that's on both ends from exactly. the streets streets to the police department. Man, and we got to hold each other accountable. Right. Like if the officer doing something wrong, we got to hold him or her accountable. Right. But the same thing with the streets. Mm-hmm. We got to hold him or her accountable. Yeah. And it got to go both ways. Yeah, both ways. And people don't want to hear that. Like, right, yeah. And that's why I draw the line because I'm going to stand on what's right mm-hmm. no matter what. Mm-hmm. And people don't know. It ain't always popular staying on what's righteous. Right, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I right. take a lot of heat. You know, that happened to me recently, but right. I just take it on the chin. Right. But that would make you who you are, though. Oh, no you know question. what I'm saying? You built for it. And like you say, it's almost got to find a way to make that communication piece with the police. We ain't saying you got to go to dinner, hang out, or party, but you got to have it. Got to be a, a communication where you come through the door because a little quick short story. I was drive drive one day uh, coming up 17th Street about to turn the heck of Jamal, so a um, mock car come behind me. I ain't seen. I guess she wanted to get around, so she. I'm waiting for the traffic to come. Yeah. She put the, put the highways on, so I look back. She, she started me a little bit. She pulled inside, say, "Get your MF off this goddamn street." Pulled up t- ten yards and turned the light off. It was just driving. Yeah. So I'm saying to myself, hold on, man. I, I went behind her. So she yeah. going to 5th D. I'm right, right behind her. She going to, I guess the, 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 the car's going 5th D behind yeah. the back. Yeah. I park and going inside. So now I'm like, shit, man. I'm paying taxes. Yeah. I ain't breaking on low. I ain't doing nothing, right? And I and I went and I say, man, look, it's a it's a detective lady. She's about to come in there. I need We need to talk because she just cussed me up, called my name. All I doing was turn the heck of yeah. Jamal. They was like, one of the dudes knew me. said, man, said, all day. I said, yeah. So he said, hold up. He went back and talk to her. I don't know what they said to her. She came back in there, so apologetic, so what's the name? That's it. When I left Slim, I, I swear to God, I tell my kids this. I feel so good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That I, that I went and did it the legal way. Went That's there, a citizen, talk man. Talked to the joint, man. I say, man, I feel the good about it, man. And, they, and the officers work for you. Right, yeah. And that's what we got to realize. These officers get paid tax dollars to work for right. the community, man. That's Even myself as a, as a civic leader, as a politician, I work for the community. So right. we got to always keep that in front. The right. moment we forget that, right. we're going to misuse our power, man. Right, yeah. Yeah, right. and that's anybody. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's a lot of, like I say, it's a lot of good officers in D.C. You just spoke of one. You know, the, the chief, you know what I'm saying? Watch them grow up. You know, I know a lot of them, man. You know, so it's like we need, we need to find a way to bridge that relationship. I don't know how how to do it, but sometimes way we just got to find a way to work on yeah. getting better, where people can feel comfortable with telling their truth. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. sometimes people raise up, they got the truth to help them. Not, I ain't saying no other stuff in court. I'm just saying on the crime scene, far as getting some help for a little baby or a little girl, we got to be able to translate that communication where it can happen, so people can be saved, right? But man, uh, him and that man, what is one of the biggest misconceptions about Treyon Wright? One of the biggest misconceptions about Trayon White. Yeah, damn, I don't know what they be saying. But they... <laughs> I don't know, but you know they always got, you know they got something. You know, I always got something. Somebody man. got something. I know it's something you heard that line, like, man, what the hell they, they say that? They got me all well, twisted, I know one man. of the things that irked me is that it happened yesterday. They said, man, dang, are you you only work in Southeast. Oh, okay. okay. I hear that all the time. Right, right. It's like it's like if, if I'm the mayor of New York, I'm not going to be the working the door on mayor stuff in in Washington, D.C., right. you know what I'm saying? Right. And it's not necessarily those uh, dichotomies, but it's just like, man, I have a service to the, the reward that, 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 that elected me, right? Right? Because right. I'm the Ward 8 council member. Right. But people don't know that Ward 8 got six council members. Right. We got the Ward 8 council member, four at large, right. and the chairman, including me, you know? And Ooh. that's the same for all the wards. Right. And so I, I asked the average person that say that, I said, name, name five council members. Oh, yeah. They get this, they get stuck, right? Because yeah. you only can say me because you know me because I'm right. relevant. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so that's one of the biggest misconceptions. That I only work in Ward Eight, but I, I work more than Ward Eight, and I don't always advertise it. Leaving me working over the jail, I don't have to right. work over the jail. Right. I'm volunteering right. doing that. That, right. that ain't my job. I'm not right. even on the judiciary committee. Right. But that's my passion, mm-hmm. and that's why I know I got a voice to help that population transition mm-hmm. and to help some real men stand up in that jail to keep some of that violence down. Right. Yeah. So. 
I do a lot. I get a lot of heat behind that. They like you only go, you only in what? Because I'm on social media. Right. I'm probably the most popular politician on social media right. in DC politics. So yeah. I got to take the heat. You then know. You got, then you got that fly stuff on. Man, got to be seen. You looking fly? You got the you, right. you got the fly dress dress on. Man, you stay cute. Right. Stuff, you know yeah, you I stay. Get... No, I ain't just talking about that. No, nah, they they worried they been wearing. They wear my stuff. You yeah, know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, no question. You, you look. You call them my poppers and buy. No man, question. Pull your money out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you know. Oh yeah. No, I ain't talking. I'm just talking. You being fly. You put the fly. You know what I'm talking about? See, so that's some popularity too. Yeah, man, you know, I spend a lot of money in Hugo Balls and South Carolina. Right. They ain't never done nothing for me right. on my community. Yeah. So anytime we had to give it to one of our right. local minority yeah. businesses, yeah. man, got to, yeah. got to put yeah. it on, man. Yeah. Shout out to Museum. They, I mean, they came in him and Greg. Oh, yeah. with the, man, um, we had a, good, had a good show, man. Exactly. Good time, man. Solid good dudes, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, man, you grew up in Southeast. Southeast really was the, the birth of Go-Go. Yeah, you had to have a go-go band. You you play in the band, yeah, your yeah, drummer yeah. talking. What you do? I know you did. Man, something. I had a little small go-go band in the basement of the building. Man, how you know about it? <laughs> <laughs> it was called Wayne Head. Wayne. Yeah, yeah. I was the leader of the whole group. It was actually me, uh, four of my little cousins and my little brother. Right. Yeah. 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 I had put some stuff together. My my older cousin Fetz had left some stuff in the house. Right. Yeah. And you know, I took his stuff, and made us a little band. You made a little band. Yeah, man. <laughs> but the band fell apart, man. <laughs> Why you name Wayne Head though, man? <laughs> My little cousin named Dwayne. Yeah. And I had a song I made him called Wayne Head. Right. He had a big old head. He got right. Wayne But that was my little cousin. And, and, but, you know, it fell apart, man. You know how it is. Right. The group dynamics. Right. Everybody wanted to be the leader. But we had a lot of fun. And yeah. we were just making too much noise in the hallway. Right, well, yeah. I grew up in an apartment, so we'd be in the laundry room and cranking. Oh I mean, cranking yeah. for two summers, Kurt. Oh, yeah. We had one song for two summers. Did, did, did y'all ever get to a cookout or anything? And y'all ain't never get Y'all ain't never take this show outside of the grass, if man. If you move our equipment too much, it's going to fall apart. You got to keep it still. <laughs> You got to throw a sheet over in the laundry room. Oh Nobody don't touch God, it. Man. Man, we had some raggedy equipment, man. Uh, so who, yeah. give me your top favorite. I know you like all go-go beats, but give me your top three favorite go-go bands. Man, I can't do that, man. Oh, come on, trouble, man. They, they man. not going to take it first, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> 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 hey, man. I can't do that. Give me your top I, I three leads. Go, go. <laughs> give me your top three leads. Drop was nah. there, man. You can't give me that name. <laughs> hey, man. man, it's it's a lot of. I think I think it's like a lot of the old older bands that's doing a remarkable job keeping. You know, you know historically in DC, Gogo has been our music. Did you see that somebody had a Gogo band? And uh, where was that? It was out of town. Where was Ohio? It? Ohio. They got a go-go band in Ohio. Okay, well, well. You seen that? No, I haven't seen that. Yeah. How long how long have been this? On, this on social media last week. Is it new or they had it for years man, ago? I don't know. They was in there cranking too, man. Had a go-go band in Ohio. But I say that because with GC being so gentrified, the go-go band community had to really raise up in the last two man. years because the new people moving in were saying, man, keep the noise down. Man. And so I know uh, uh, Don't Mute DC. Some of the uh, Google community stood up and started fighting against that, you oh, know, yeah. saying that this is our sound, this is our community, this is right. our DC. Yeah. And so it kept the really the social fabric and the culture strong right. in the community. I was talking to Latoya Foster uh, yeah. to run the Office of Cable Television and yeah, Entertainment. Sister, yeah. yeah, that we got to figure out a way to keep uh, to keep our sound going in DC, man. Mm -hmm. And empower those young men and ladies on the front line, keeping our music loud and vibrant. Right. You know, I've been saying some of the Google bands like, Backyard, them going to Africa. Right. I'm like, man, you know, they. Uh, I was listening to Jay Sun talk about the Kungas mm -hmm. uh, and, and Congos, mm -hmm. uh, th how that came from Africa. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, right. yeah, I just, yeah. Right. So, who, who are some of the, uh, some of the um, hip hop artists in DC you listen to? I know you listen to the Wale's and Shy. Any up and coming youngers you listen to that you've been paying attention to? Not really, man. I listen to, I listen to, I, I do mentor on the side of the schools. Uh -huh. So it's really like whoever the youngest I'm Talk around, about, right. whatever they listen to, I listen to, right. try to figure out what's uh -huh. going on yeah. because it, the, the sound is in the music. Yeah. You know, you can figure out what's going on in the community with the dynamics of the streets yeah. through the music, man. Yeah. So uh, I think that I, I don't really know a lot of the artists, honestly. Mm -hmm. I might look like I do, but I don't. Right. Um, but I try to stay in tune right. to what's going on. I know, like you know, some of the, the different neighborhood yeah. artists are going. I don't try to mention them because it's right, too much right, beef right, going right. on with the, with the BS, right. man. Because our thinking has to be elevated to a level where we can have sound judgment to support all people. Because right. DC, you know, we looking to elevate some of our artists in the music and and in the entertainment right. industry. Yeah. Right. yeah, that's crazy. 
I'm gonna say some names and just give me whatever your thoughts about these people. Um, Murray and Barry. Legend. Legend. Legend, man. Yeah, I don't think I'd be who I am if it wasn't for me rubbing lives with the, with a genius like that. Murray right. Bird was a political genius. Right, right. Um, and his his heart and his charisma and his intellect was profound. That's echoing throughout gen generations. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just grateful and thankful because, you know, growing up in D.C., everybody got a story about Murray and Burry. Right. And it was like, man, I was just thankful that God allowed me to rebelize for him before he transitioned. Mm -hmm. And his, my story is intertwined with his story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The current uh, mayor of Bowser. Bowser. I like Bowser. I think Bowser got a lot of good intentions. Mm -hmm. I just think that, you know, she need more people on the ground around her mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that can kind of enlighten her to what's really going on versus what she think may be happening. Right. And so in politics, Murray and Burry taught me there's no no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. Mm. So it's like, man, we got to figure out sometimes, we can always talk about what we disagree on, right? but we got to figure out how we can agree on things. And we've agreed on a lot of things like the hospital, we built a new home. A new homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, we build a we build a senior home with, mm -hmm. with the Reunion Square. Mm -hmm. We doing a lot of great things, you know. Right. Um, that she might all might not always get the credit for. Right. But being a council member, I have to depend on the mayor to put the money in the budget right. to get some of these things done with the with the with the wrecks and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, we 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 clash a lot, mm -hmm. but it's love there to some degree. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, at large, Kenya McDuffie, DC native. Okay. Solid. Yeah, I, I like Kenya. He was one of the first people who embraced me on the DC City Council It kind of taught me the ropes from what was going on in the inner workings of the council. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing being a spectator, trying to figure out what's happening, but it's one thing being in there and it's moving so fast. Mm -hmm. It's a fast paced job and it's politics and it's mm -hmm. cutthroat. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's like the streets really, except you just can't slap or shoot nobody. Right, so right, it's right, the same right, thing. Right, yeah, right, right, yeah. right, yeah. 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 That, that's, you, you drove a good oh, picture nah, right man, there. Huh? Man, yeah. You be looking at what's going on and be like, ain't no way, but right, you know, right. you talking about being at the table with 19 billion. Right. Yeah, this conversation get real, real serious, real well, quick. Yeah, serious, real quick. In it, yeah, because huh? <laughs> you making a decision that's gonna take away from my my people. Right. Now we can't have that. Right. And right. So I like Kenya and Kenya that put up a good fight. You know, he ran for AG. He ended up running again, mm -hmm. back not as a Ward Five council member, but as a at large council member. And he really, it really, really brought DC people from all over the city back to get mm -hmm. involved again. Kind of mm -hmm. like everybody gave a push mm -hmm. for Kenya, man. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and so I think Kenyon is has is very intelligent, man. Mm -hmm. He he does a lot for uh minority mm -hmm. black businesses in DC. In fact, he helped us start what we call him right now in Ward 8, the, the Black Wall Street mm -hmm. in Ward 8, just the MLK Go Road Corridor. We pretty mm -hmm. much empowering all those businesses economically so they can stay there when when the, when the rent get too high. Mm -hmm. that, so they won't no longer rent anymore, they can own their buildings. Right. And that's the power. And we trying to and so Kenyon McDuffie was integral in that, integral and in, um uh, some of the laws that's been passed that allow that's, mm -hmm. that's seeing public safety as a public health crisis mm -hmm. and putting the resources behind that. So mm -hmm. I work with Kenyon a lot, man. I have even be, even beyond the council. Remember me, uh, Silas, Tony Lewis, mm -hmm. uh, Perp, uh, Angel, a lot of us, Greg, we, Jimmy, we got together a long time ago, mm -hmm. Ron Moten, to kind of figure out how we can create a platform that's gonna work for indigenous people of DC mm -hmm. beyond the wards. And so mm -hmm. that started before I was a councilman. So I appreciate him for convening some of those conversations early on. Yeah, he is a good bro. He, he actually was one who uh, pointed me to go to the wards and start doing uh, the mental, the credible message work okay. over there. Yeah. yeah. He was talking about that couple together before it actually came together. Um, Lil Greg from the uh, museum. Family. Family. Family, man. Yeah, yeah. Family. But actually, a lot of the stuff I learned uh, coming up, I got it from Greg. Mm -hmm. Greg, so you know, people don't know, Greg used to go to Martin Luther King Elementary School. Right. And when he was in MLK, I was going to Mercer Surreal up around the corner. Mm -hmm. But we all grew up together. And he used to draw stuff in class mm -hmm. and sell like little drawings in class for a dollar to the front to us, to everybody in class for a dollar. Oh, yeah. So he, used to, he was a designer early on. Right. And his parents, kind of breathed on that, you right, know, right. And, and he had, you know, he got a father and a mother, mm -hmm. and he was one of the few kids growing up that had a father that was right. around, you right. know what I'm saying, Pancho, mm -hmm. uh, Brother Fahim, and so when we played, he played with me on number 11, since right. we was little, I got pictures when we was little kids running oh, yeah. around, yeah, 
way, way, way oh, yeah. back. Oh yeah. And so I knew he was gonna make it. You know, Greg graduated three point eight GPA yeah, yeah, from from yeah. V State. And so yeah. you know he was in the music before right. before that with the board administration, him, Mo, and some of the other brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. But yeah, mm -hmm. man, that's that's like that's that's family, man. I leaned to him for a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. He was in my wedding. Right. You yeah. know, he, yeah, Greg, solid man, always yeah. had been. Yeah, great man. That's why I want to get your yeah. perspective on that. Jay Z. Jay Z. Yeah. I like Jay Z. I'm growing to like Jay Z. I'm not a really original Jay Z fan. Right. Okay. You know, um, I'm more so a Tupac. Okay. Yeah. I'm also yeah. Yeah. Uh, fight, yeah, 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 yeah I'm also a Tupac yeah. type of guy. Right, yeah. But no, right, I mean, you don't have right. to choose just one. Right. But as I as I get older and really start listening to music as I mature, I, I realize how cunning he is with his music and how mm. crafty he is with his language. You know. Mm. Uh, did you? I was. I watched the, what he said about OJ. You know, oh, yeah. he said. Uh, he said, "I'm not. I'm not black." I'm OJ. Right, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> and he was referencing um, when um, Johnny Cochran was fighting for OJ, and OJ got mad and said, "I'm not. I'm not black. Right. I'm OJ." Right, right. And OJ just clapped back last week and said he. It was all taken out of context. Right. OJ was saying that man, you you talking about fight for black people? F black people. Fight for OJ. Right. I'm OJ. <laughs> And you know, and it was it was crafty how Jay Z took that and, and put that. in the song. He's like, you're not OJ, right, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's you know, right. and you know the name of the song, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He flipped so, that. He flipped yeah, that. so it was yeah, crafty. So yeah. I started like hearing the lyrics more, and make me appreciate this music more. Right. Yeah. yeah. Recently, we, recently we had uh, had uh, Washington Tony come on. Tony Lewis Senior uh, from doing 34 years. In Shout prison. out to Tony Lewis Senior, man. And Tony Lewis Junior fought and clawed and fight and fought and fought, man. Ah. Yeah, man. What's your thoughts on that whole situation, man? Man, I just feel like we are over criminalized as black people in America, man. It's supposed to be home of the free in the United States, yet we incarcerate more people than 13 countries combined, man. Mm. And unfortunately, black and brown people get the short end of the stick, man. I was at a conference a few years ago at the CJCC conference, and they was even saying, like, people with dark complexions that get convicted for the same crime get more time than people with lighter complexions. Damn. And I hear that this brother was in jail for 30 years. I was just with uh, Anton White at a retreat the other day. Mm -hmm. These brothers did 30 years for, well, Tone did 30, I mean, uh, uh, Tony Lewis did uh, 30, 34 years for a nonviolent offense, mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. No violence. Mm -hmm. I know people that did bodies, right. got bodies and right. came home. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. Yeah. Came home, man, uh -huh. and then to hear Anton's story, he did time for a charge he was never fully convicted of, mm -hmm. never convicted of. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? He was yeah. a, he they they never charged him with it. Mm -hmm. and he did what tw twenty nine years, eight like months, twenty nine. Like yep, they're almost thirty. Come yep. on, man! Yeah. Like, come on, man! That ain't yeah. happening to no other race of people right. in American history. It's just right. modern day slavery and yeah. voluntary servitude. It go back to the Thirteenth Amendment, man. Yeah. I think that to see him come home is going to give a lot of brothers in that penal institution hope, man. Right. And we seen a lot of big brothers come home and do very well. You know, mm -hmm. Ronald. Uh, you know, uh, guys like Marky, you got a lot of good, smooth, you got a lot right. of guys coming home doing right. remarkable things that's right. not just sitting on the sideline, right. but actively getting involved and changing their communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that's important, man. That's right. Yeah. Anything we didn't touch on today that you want to touch on? Oh, we close well, we touched, we touched on a lot, Kirk. I ain't yeah, know what you're going to yeah, ask me today, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, look, man. I'm just trying to get the traffic well, and get here. Hey, whatever. I, I know you're going to be ready, whatever, actually, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Yeah, so it's nothing you can think of that you make sure it's, you it's all love. Something. I just man, this 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 the, the the way the city going, man. I'm concerned, right? Really, right? When we think about the economic disparities in the city mm. and the race of our people with the homicides and and, and the stabbings and the shootings mm. and the schools, right? Mm. Our kids not not doing well academically in school and large numbers, man. It's mm. concerning to me. And I feel like, man, if we don't unify and create a strong agenda, because mm -hmm. people say we got a youth violence problem. I say, nah, we don't got a youth problem. We got a, we got a, a daddy problem. Mm -hmm. we, it's the absence of strong men mm -hmm. active in their community because we know the black queens in our community held us down for almost mm -hmm. three, gener mm -hmm. three generations, right? Mm -hmm. It's time for men to start restoring order mm -hmm. in our community. And so I'm gonna be doing a call, man, for men in our community to come together. And we want the queens to come too mm -hmm. because we need them, because they got gifts that we don't have. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the reality is, man, it's not a it's not a youth problem, man. It's really a, a man problem. Mm -hmm. We get we lack strong men integrating and giving order and structure uh, to to our communities, man. So we got to start. We we have to start this work, man. We see what's going on each and every day, and we imagine what's going to be in the summertime, man. So 
Uh, that's that's really on my heart over the last couple of weeks, man, going into the summer. Right. I totally concur with every syllable you just said. That statement right there, man, that's definitely something we need to highlight and get better with, the, you know, in the band department, man. Man, I want to just... You know, thank you, man. Really, really thank you for, you know, for giving me time. I know you got a business schedule. You got, got, got somewhere to go you leave here. I ran to you the other day. You was in the wrong restaurant looking for a, a, another event, man. <laughs> like, you're scheduling, but you just, you just always on the move, man. Yeah, man. Doing that, man. And I had called an Uber. I had to walk all the way to the other event, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we was an Irish City Smoker. Out. The event was like, it was like around the corner somewhere. Right, but, right, you know, right. it is what it is. Yeah. Man, I like to leave just uh, like a recap of, man, just thinking about your story. And when I think of your story, it's a it's a story that I say perseverance, um, dedication, spiritual. Yeah, no question. Um, not giving up the fight. I mean, man, you coming from you was you was born in Southeast Washington D.C. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for those who around the country don't know, especially at that time, even now, I mean, you know, it was you walk outside you walk into a, a potential of a felony or being a victim or something, right? Yeah. And you chose to be an entrepreneur legally at a juvenile age. You went to school, killed the books, came out, you're a counselor, man. You really a testimony to a lot. Like, someone could look at you and say, you can't make no excuses. You know what I'm saying? You're in the house of two bedroom with, how many people in the house of two bedroom? It was eight of us. Eight, 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 yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, you got, yeah. so it's like, so, man, you 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 are you are you are a walking testament, man. I think that, I think your story going to be yeah. on the screen one day. You know what I'm saying? It's a living motion picture. Every day you go on, you're still building on it, right? And I think the world going to be is is yours to do what you want to do because you put the work in it, man. I just wish you nothing but more success, more blessing, it, man. man, and whatever your devils is, man. And thanks for coming, man. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honor, man. man. God Definitely, is good, man. man. Yes, sir. Make yes, sir. sure y'all subscribe, man. The Kirk Bone TV, Treyon White, the Councilman, War Eight. Southie DC where no he was question. born and raised. Born and raised. Shout out to, <laughs> to the government, man. Yeah, my man Miles. Miles down the phone. Yeah, no yeah, question. my man. Out the park, niggas know me. Curb on, little homie. All days, all days. Been a road, been a road. Yeah. Thank you for watching Changing Jewels on Kirkbone TV. If you like the jewels that we are dropping, subscribe, hit the notification, and share with some friends. And I'll see you on the next episode of Changing Jewels, Kirkbone TV.